Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and tonight I'm going to record the first part of a two-part lecture on gross pathology of the skin of the pig. As I do before all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues for making these images available to me. This first image is a great one by Dr. Raquel Retch from Texas A&M University which shows the carpal glands of the pig. These are normal structures and we're looking at the pores of the apocrine complex which makes the carpal glands on the inside of the front legs. These glands are most well developed in boars but females have them as well. And their secretions play a role in social communication between pigs by producing chemical and pheromone signals involved in territorial definition as well as reproduction. This next image from Dr. Jens Tefka is a condition in pigs known as hypotrichosis localis cystica. And in German-speaking countries, it is referred to as Schrotauschlag. These look like apocrine cysts, which would not be uncommon around the prepuce of a pig, but actually these are epidermal inclusion pigs and may be seen all over the pig, most commonly on the back or areas where the skin is covered with sparse, bristly hair, including the sacrum and the tail. When opened, these cysts contain sebaceous secretions, horn flakes and scales, and spiraled fragments of bristled hair fragments. A second form is reported to be non-blistering, which lacks the formation of these protruding cysts with spiral or arcuate hairs located beneath, beneath the translucent dermis. Hypotrichosis localis cystica. Our next image is a classic lesion of neonatal animals which is seen in a number of species and here it is in the pig and we're missing a large area of epithelium and the superficial dermis. The name of the condition is epitheliogenesis imperfecta and in species in which the genetics have been worked out it is due to lack of a component of hemidesmosomes called laminin. You can tell this is a very young pig if you look closely because you can see the umbilical cord. In pigs, epitheliogenesis perfecta is a sporadic congenital defect that occurs on many farms. Lesions have been described mainly on the trunk of affected piglets, but also can be seen in the distal limbs as seen here. Some authors have also reported epithelial defects in the oral cavity. Because of the defect in hemidesmosomes, this skin is usually stripped off during parturition, and lesions in the oral cavity may occur during suckling movements either in utero or shortly after birth. Interestingly, in the pig you may also see concomitant hydronephrosis and hydroureter as well. This defect is full thickness, for the epidermis and extends down into the middermis with loss of adnexal structures and follicles as well. Small lesions like this, if given enough time, may scar in and contract over time. In human medicine, this condition is called aplasia cutis congenita, probably a better name than epitheliogenesis imperfecta. Here's a, another disease of very young pigs which manifest skin lesions. These are hemorrhages and you can see thrombocytopenic hemorrhages in baby pigs just like we see in foals with neonatal isoerythrolysis and the pathogenesis is very similar. This condition happens after repeated pregnancies between a sow and a boar with incompatible erythrocyte antigens. The erythrocyte antigens are passed onto the 
piglets in utero. And during the course of the pregnancy, the sow is isoimmunized against these antigens and she'll form antibodies which she passes back to the piglets in the colostrum. The piglets are born normal and then they begin to sicken some days after delivery as the antibodies attack the so-called foreign antigens on their erythrocytes. Because foreign antigens are present on the megakaryocytes and platelets as well, a thrombocytopenia often occurs the hemolytic anemia. Although it's not covered in this lecture, there is a condition known as thrombocytopenia purpura in Gottingen mini pigs, which are aged seven weeks to one year. Because of the age difference, it's a very different pathogenesis with the lesions in these mini pigs primarily being that of a severe vasculitis and accompanying thrombocytopenia. If you look very closely at the skin of this neonatal pig, you will see a number of small blisters which result by infection with pseudorabies. We've talked about pseudorabies and its effects on neonatal pigs less than two weeks where it is usually fatal. And the virus will infect the skin resulting in ballooning degeneration, necrosis of epithelial cells, and intranuclear inclusions in the stratum spinosum and undergo what is known as zosteriform spread where the virus enters the axons of skin nerves and travels up the nerves into the CNS, often locating in the trigeminal ganglion. In young pigs, this will be associated with a severe meningitis, necrosis of a wide range of cells, which will have inclusions including neurons, astrocytes, oligodendria, and respiratory epithelium, and the animal will die, usually with the gross signs of a severe hemorrhagic meningitis. Pseudorabies may approach 100% mortality in neonates, but both morbidity and mortality decreases as the animals get older. Wean pigs between the ages of three to nine weeks have similar signs, but mortality is far lower. And as we pass 10 weeks in finishing swine up to market weight, the neurologic signs are rarely seen and are taken over by respiratory signs. Morbidity may be high, but mortality is much lower. In rare cases, Areas of necrosis with inclusions may be seen in many organs of the body in young pigs. Here is a classic lesion of the skin of pigs, which can affect all age groups, but most outbreaks are encountered in young growing pigs. And this is swine pox. The morphologic diagnosis for this pox lesion is like all other pox lesions. These are areas of necrotizing and proliferative dermatitis. The outer ring of tissue is proliferative and the older, more central areas, which were infected first, are necrotic due to the cytopathic effects of the pox virus. Swine pox occurs only in swine and we've been able to markedly decrease the incidence now because modern swine are raised free of the most common vector, the hog louse, hematopinus suis. Other blood sucking insects can transmit it, and it can also be transmitted through direct contact. Swine pox can also be transmitted transplacentally, so newborn or aborted pigs may display evidence of swine pox. The virus replicates in the cells of the stratum spinosum and the vesicle stage in this disease is almost never seen. Although like all, the, all other pox virus infections, 
there are internal lesions as well, as is not picky about the epithelium that it infects. But in pigs, unlike other species such as camels and goats and sheep, systemic clinical signs are rarely, if ever, observed. And here is the vector of swine pox and a number of other conditions, the blood-sucking louse hematopinus suus, one of the largest species of lice, which is easily seen, especially after a blood meal where it turns a reddish-black color, because these are up to six or seven millimeters in length. All age groups of swine are susceptible to infection, which is more severe in winter because pigs are congregated. As we said before, hematopinus is a sucking louse, so it obtains blood meals by poking its proboscis through the skin of the pig in sparsely haired and areas where the skin is the thinnest, including the neck, the jowl, the flanks and the inner sides of the legs. And let's not forget about the ears, in which they may go down inside the ear and reside in large numbers in nests. If the animal is concurrently infected with pityriasis rosea, which we'll look at shortly, you may also find them within the circles that that disease causes in the abdomen. Here's a great picture from Body Prinsecki from Virginia Tech. And this is also those big lice, hematopinus suus. These are white. They're not taking a blood meal at this point. They can be very irritating. And swine will often rub themselves to the point of losing their hair, going bald, and injuring their skin. However, as we've already said, the most important role for hematopinus suus is the transmission of a number of important diseases in swine, including swine pox, hog cholera, and a blood parasite previously known as epirethrozoan suus, now known as mycoplasma suus, among other diseases. I'm going to conclude this lecture with the five vesicular diseases that pigs will get. There are only five vesicular diseases, and pigs get all five of them. The most important of all these diseases is foot and mouth disease, which affects a wide range of wild and domestic animals, especially cloven hoofed mammals. Horses are resistant. This is an ancient disease which was first described in the mid-1500s. We've had nine outbreaks of foot and mouth disease here in the United States, luckily with the last one in 1929, because each outbreak causes a great expense and may devastate the pork industry. Recent outbreaks in the United Kingdom and Asia have shown how devastating this condition may be, where exports of pigs are embargoed and entire herds which affect an entire region are slaughtered, effectively destroying the swine industry in these countries. Any outbreak of vesicular disease is important because the lesions of all five cannot be distinguished grossly from those of foot and mouth disease. Because swine are known as amplifier hosts of foot and mouth disease, we are especially concerned about the disease in swine. Here is a large broken blister on the snout of this pig. Foot and mouth disease is caused by an aptovirus of the family picornavirus, and there are at least seven immunologically distinct types of virus, with over 60 subtypes 
of this virus, and most of them differ enough antigenically to require preparations of subtype vaccines for their control. Virus transmission occurs through respiratory aerosols and direct or indirect contact with infected animals, and aerosol transmission can occur over distances as great as 30 miles. So we said before, pigs are amplifier hosts. They're great disseminators of the virus, and they create virus and subsequent aerosols much higher in concentration than those produced by cattle or sheep. In addition, the virus will persist for a long time in frozen meat products. And a number of foot and mouth disease outbreaks have started by consumption by pigs of uncooked waste can turn, can, excuse me, of uncooked waste containing infectious meat scraps. Rarely outbreaks have arisen from contaminated vaccines or even people who have carried the virus in their respiratory tract from farm to farm. Once a pig is infected with foot and mouth disease because it rarely causes mortality, they may remain carriers for weeks to even years. The lesions of foot and mouth disease, as well, of all, as well as all of the other vesicular diseases, primarily arise in areas of friction and motion, such as the snout, the oral cavity, and the coronary band around the hooves. In foot and mouth disease, there is an incubation time of one to five days and lameness is often the first sign that is noticed. Then there is a rise in temperature and slobbering and chomping by affected animals due to the presence of lesions within the oral cavity. If sows are pregnant they may abort or deliver stillborn infected pigs. Infected neonates may die suddenly even before lesions show up in the sow. Other places that you may see lesions in foot and mouth and the other vesicular lesions include the interdigital cleft and occasionally the vulva and the teats of lactating sows. The, all of these viruses affect the stratum granulosum and the stratum basale or the basal layer of epithelium is preserved so these lesions, if not secondarily infected, will often heal. Even the most severe of these diseases, foot and mouth disease, does not cause much mortality in swine. And the other vesicular diseases will result in even less. Most of the mortality seen in foot and mouth disease in swine is the result of myocardial infection in young pigs up to two weeks where the virus will infect myocytes resulting in necrotizing and ultimately lymphoplasmacytic myocarditis whose scarring gives a very classic lesion known as tiger striping of the heart. Short of this, the main effect of foot and mouth disease and the lesser vesicular diseases is the marked loss of production and the economic changes that not being able to sell your product will wreak upon the pork industry in an affected country. Let's take a look at the other vesicular diseases. Now most of these are probably going to be pictures of foot and mouth disease, but we'll just pretend because they all look alike with lesions of the same character and in the same locations. Vesicular stomatitis is endemic in the US as well as Central and South America and we have outbreaks about every 10 years. It's caused by a rhabdovirus which is endemic in parts of the Southeast and Southwest US but rarely spreads to swine. Most outbreaks affect horses and cattle but you can also see it in deer and raccoons and bobcats and and rodents as well. Most infections occur in feral swine. Many of the reservoirs 
and vectors of this disease are unknown. But one strain, the New Jersey strain, is spread by sand flies. The virus infects the stratum granulosum, resulting in vesicles. Ultimately, ulcerated lesions is seen here, which will generally heal. As always, lameness is often the first visible sign with salivation and chomping and other lesions around the body. Another vesicular disease is swine vesicular disease, a transient disease of pigs like the others. The cause of agent is an enterovirus, enterovirus closely related to human enterovirus B and is thought to evolve from the human pathogen Coxsackie virus B5. It generally causes a subclinical disease and little loss of production in affected pigs. There's only one serotype of swine vesicular disease and it too may be spread by feeding infected pork or pork products. Another vesicular disease of swan is vesicular exanthema. Vesicular exanthema like these other viruses causes a very similar blistering disease whose largest importance is the fact that it could be confused with foot and mouth disease. It also has a very interesting story because it causes a disease in sea lions known as San Miguel sea lion virus. The dumping of garbage and uncooked uh, pork products largely into the ocean on the west coast of the country allowed sea lions to be exposed to this virus through an interesting transgenic host, the opali fish. Opali fish are the ones that are always caught in tidal pools and very easy prey for sea lion viruses. And the two viruses, San Miguel sea lion virus and vesicular exanthema virus, are clinically indistinguishable. Finally, the last blistering disease is a fairly new one just arrived on the, uh, uh, on the market in 2002 as a cell culture contaminant, but has made its way into a number of outbreaks uh, in the U.S. and other countries, and this is known as Seneca Valley virus, also picornavirus, like swine vesicular disease. It has been incriminated in a number of outbreaks of a disease known as idiopathic vesicular disease, which happens mostly between the spring and fall. However, experimental infections in swine with this virus have failed to produce signs of disease. And this particular picornavirus has also been isolated from healthy pigs in the U.S. So there is a lot more that we need to learn about this particular condition. Well, we've covered a number of skin diseases of pigs. We have a number more to cover, so I will invite you to wait for the next installment, which I hope to have out within a day or two, part two of diseases of the integument of swine. Thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture.